Do you think religion still has a role to play in Halloween at all? Welcome to the For All The Saints podcast and a very special Halloween episode. My very special guest today is Lisa Morton. And Lisa, it's so great to have you. Oh, thanks, man. It's fun to be here. And you are a super Halloween expert. And the amount of awards you've won and the books you've written is astounding. And uh, I'll have covered that nicely in my pre-recorded introduction. Don't worry. Uh, (laughs) And... One of the things that you say in your book, Trick or Treat, A History of Halloween, is that it's the most misunderstood holiday. Um, why? What do we misunderstand about Halloween? There are so many things, and, and I hear them all the time, and I think you can just start with the name. Um, I would guess that there are very few Americans in particular um, who can give you the slightest hint of what that name means. Because it, it almost has this odd, exotic sound to it. Um, very few of them know that the first part of the name comes from an obsolete term for the saints, hollows. Um, the second part is an abbreviated part of evening. Um, so the name itself actually means hollows evening it, because the, the back then the days were celebrated on that when the sun went down on the, the eve before the actual day. So All Saints Day, which was set for November 1st, actually started at sundown on the on 31st. And so that's where we get the name from. And, and um, like I said, it's amazing how few people know, you know, you compare it to New Year's Eve or Christmas. Um, I think most people can tell you exactly what those things mean. But um, even Valentine's Day, people know, oh, there was a St. Valentine, et cetera. Halloween is just right off the bat, the naming is strange. And then, of course, its history is um, very old and very confusing to a lot of people. They didn't do anything like go trick-or-treating, go house-to-house begging treats. Um, That's all completely misunderstood. Uh, And what led you to um, have this sort of desire to study Halloween and write about it? It's something I actually just almost fell into by accident. Um, About 20 years ago, I had done a film book for a publisher. And when I finished that book, they said, hey, would you like to do another book with us? And I looked at their current catalog of titles they had just brought out, and they had something called the Christmas Encyclopedia. And so I rather brilliantly said, hey, how about a Halloween encyclopedia? And not even really thinking much about what kind of project I was letting myself in for. And of course, it took several years. Um, And by the time you are done writing an encyclopedic reference to something, you are pretty much obsessed for life. (laughs) So um, (laughs) also, it was very easy to take the massive amount of information that I accrued putting that book together and roll it over into other books. Right, I see. And I see you've still got the, uh, you've got some Halloween masks up uh, on your background there with uh, Frankenstein and, uh, yeah. Those are two empty masks. The entire wall behind me is Halloween-themed art, which is one of the things I love to collect. Right. Yeah, that's brilliant. I love it. And uh, what is the true history of Halloween then? Because I, I know when I read your books and uh when you write about it and when you've been on other podcasts as well there's sort of this there there's academic thought which uh seems inaccurate in some ways there's other thought there's as you mentioned celtic tribes involved what actually is the true history the true origin there are two two schools of thought on that um i fall into the school that thinks that it definitely descends from the celtic celebration of Samhain. The other side thinks that it is almost completely Catholic in origin, that it stems from the original celebrations of All Saints Day. To me, it definitely gets its macabre side from Samhain. Um, There was not a lot that was incredibly macabre about celebrating the lives of saints. 
But Samhain, on the other hand, was definitely a spooky time for the ancient Celts. It was their New Year's celebration. The name itself, which looks like it should be pronounced Samhain, um, was a time when they brought all the cattle in from the fields, when they hunkered down for a long winter. Um, it was, uh, the name does mean summer's end. And it was a time when they thought the veil between worlds was at its thinnest because it was such a liminal time. They were moving into this cold part of the year and um, changing the way they lived, in essence, for the next few months. So they thought it was a night when this veil was down, when things could cross over. They believed in these incredibly malicious creatures called the she which nowadays we would call fairies, but the fairies are as far away from a Disney Tinkerbell as you can get. These were things that would come over on Samhain and would burn down their palaces, would bring corpses to life, would kidnap humans and take them back to their other world with them. Um, they, they were very malicious, and we do have a number of really incredible Samhain tales that the early Catholic missionaries to Ireland recorded. And some of these things are still very frightening. Uh, there's there's one, I think my favorite one is about a hero named uh, Nira who gets sent out to um, by the king on Samhain Eve and, and he's given this assignment. And he's, the assignment is, well, you have to go and put a loop around the foot of this corpse that's been hung. No one else has been able to do this. If you do it, I'll give you this this magic sword. And so this hero goes out, and he is successful in putting this loop around the foot of this corpse. And when he does, the corpse comes to life, which is already pretty scary. But this gets scarier. It says to him, I'm thirsty. I died hung up here, and I'd like a drink. Can you do a house to get a drink? And so he leads this corpse to this house where the kind people in the house give this corpse a drink, and it spits it in their faces and kills them. I mean, this is this is totally horror movie stuff, and I think there is no question that this is where uh, Halloween acquired its hide from. Yeah, is this um, when you say the the creatures were called she? Was it a she? It is spelled S I D H traditionally, but it is also you can hear that that little tiny root in the uh, creature Banshee. Banshee actually means a female fairy. And the oh, Banshee right. is one of the the other things that has come down from that early Celtic belief. And what did they think this... Uh, you said it was like a fairy, um, but were there any sort of depictions made of what they believed a, a she to look like? I have never seen one, and I, I would certainly love to see one. Um, I think from the way they seem to be described in some of the, the legends and the fairy tales and so forth, they, they don't seem to have been small by any means. They were, I think, probably just very human and life-sized. Um, they In later uh, traditions, as you move through the centuries, they end up becoming sort of confused with ghosts. If you look at later uh, folk tales from Scotland and from Ireland, you get these things where the she are often described as being with the spirits of dead humans, and then they just become even more confused. And so they were probably, from the beginning, somewhat ghostly humanoid creatures. That's so cool. Uh, and did they did these Celts, did they do rituals on this evening at all? Like, uh, I don't know, you, I'm getting these images of those films where they're dancing around a fire or something that is a popular popularized misconception i think that kind of stems from the way that uh historians in the 19th century had a habit of exoticizing everything and um i have a number of the original etchings from the 19th century that show Celt dancing around a fire and the caption will read something like wild orgies of the druids and um yeah the truth is we don't know a lot about how they celebrated because they didn't leave a written history. But what we know comes from the Catholic missionaries. And we do know that it was a party for them. They celebrated apparently for three days um, wow. because it just brought everything in from the fields. They had a lot of fresh meat. Um, they told 
people that they saw each other at the time. They also did a lot of boring administrative duties because it was the end of the year. They collected taxes, they paid off debts, that kind of thing. But they also engaged in this big party. And there is some archaeological evidence to suggest that they may have had certain rituals like um, a yearly sacrifice to ensure that their livestock and so forth would be good in the coming year. Um, so it's possible they can human sacrifice. Again, we're not entirely clear on that. We do have some evidence. Yeah, human sacrifice, which of course is another myth when you see things like the wicker man and so forth, and there is human sacrifice involved. Um, I think it was Caesar who did indeed describe the Celts building these big, gigantic wicker figures that they imprisoned people in. But um, that, even that um, eyewitness account is a little bit suspect to a lot of modern historians. Right. So it sounds like even though it was very macabre and quite dark and a, a heavy sort of cautionary tale kind of, you know, that sort of darkness of it, that there was still a lot of celebrating in it and it was still quite a sort of joyful amidst, weirdly joyful <laughs> amidst all of that. Yeah, exactly, which, you know, is not that dissimilar to some of the things we do now. Yeah, I suppose when you look at it, when you put a magnifying glass on Halloween, it is quite, uh, you know, there are some very dark, uh, well, I have a list, actually, of, of a few popular items that we'll see in Halloween, and I just wonder if one by... There's only three of them, but if one by one we could sort of see how on earth they got introduced. So the first one being uh, pumpkins. The the pumpkin, the jack-o'-lantern, um, derives from an ancient folktale that's found all over... Uh, Europe and America and the British Isles, which is the legend of Jack the Trickster. And Jack was this uh, character in many versions of the tale. He's a blacksmith, but he's very clever. And he outwits the devil three times and uh, it outwits the devil in terms of taking his soul. So when Jack does finally die, heaven obviously doesn't want him, but now the devil is mad at him and doesn't let him into hell. And all the devil does is throw him this burning hell em ember, and Jack puts that in this carved-out gold board, and he uses that to light his way as he wanders the world forever in spirit form. And so the Irish in particular were great uh, lovers of jokes and pranks, and, and they would often celebrate Halloween by taking a turd up, which is what they had in Ireland. They didn't have pumpkins, of course and carving a, a sort of spooky looking face in it and they would put a candle inside and put that out somewhere on Halloween night when an unwary traveler might turn a corner and abruptly see this glowing face and um, equate it with the, the stories of Jack the Trickster. And uh, when the Irish and the Scottish came to America, mainly in the 1840s because they were escaping famine, they brought these pranks with them. And of course, as soon as they saw those gorgeous pumpkins in the New World, um, those became the uh, replacement for the, the turnips and so forth. And it's not really, though, until about the 1890s, the end of that century, that you get this glowing pumpkin kind of enshrined as the king of Halloween symbols. Um, it took the mid-19th century American matrons discovering the holiday mainly through magazine articles and reading about it and thinking it sounded delightful and following it themselves to really discover some of these traditions. And it's funny that um, I have, for example, an 1897 pamphlet on how to stage a Halloween party, and it suggests wow. carving jack out of all kinds of things and some of it I have no idea how this would have worked I mean they suggest apples and cucumbers along with pumpkins <laughs> and I can't imagine carving a tiny face into an apple apparently it was possible but they um and then by the time you get into the early 20th century you get this beautiful image of this orange gourd um being merchandised and showing up in decorations and uh postcards and all kinds of things and it's really about by about 1910 the pumpkin is the king right yeah it's so interesting i i haven't heard maybe people listening have and they'll tell me if i'm just being 
um, ignorant or also not remembering it. But I have never heard the story of Jack the Trickster. And uh, and when I think about pumpkins too, we don't really, you know, we don't eat pumpkin pie. Um, we don't really have much to do with pumpkins. But as soon as the weeks leading up to Halloween come, the shops are filled with huge buckets of pumpkins uh, of all different sizes and uh you just my only interaction with pumpkin in the year is scooping it out and carving it up and putting a candle in it until it goes rotten and chucking it out again uh so i find that so interesting that it's become such an icon of halloween the next item witches witches on on broomsticks with warts and big chins and big noses and how uh, how did witches become a part, a cultural part of Halloween? Witches have an interesting political origin in terms of being associated with Halloween. Back in the 16th century, um, when there were still witch persecutions and trials going on, um, of all people, King James, and this is the same, same King James who is on many of our Bibles, um, King James was the king of Scotland at this point, and he was obsessed with witches and demons. In fact, he actually wrote a book called Demonology, and he was overseeing a series of witch trials, and I think these were all set around a place called North Berwick. And one of the, um, he was trying to separate himself from the Catholic Church at the time, and one of the things that the Church of England and, and people like King James were doing to disassociate themselves from the Catholic Church was get rid of all the Catholic celebrations. And All Saints Day was at that time a major religious observance. And so it's interesting that the first time that you ever see witches giving confessions in which they say we celebrated our Sabbath on all Saints Day is these North Berwick trials. Um, and after that, you start to see that association very, very often. And by the time you get into even the 18th, 19th century, you will see a lot of folklore surrounding witches in Halloween. You'll see things like farmers holding up a burning broom on Halloween night over their fields to keep the witches from landing and so forth. Um, and it's interesting, though, that even then, the common image of the witch was not what we see now. And that changed forever, not until 1939. Uh, oh, wow. If you, if you look at witches before 1939, they are often dressed in red. And they just look like elderly women most of the time. They don't have green skin and a black robe and all that. We get that image from The Wizard of Oz. Um, the Wicked Witch, played by Margaret, Margaret Hamilton, just completely enshrined itself forever as the image of the witch on Halloween. Oh, I didn't realize it come from that. And uh, I think the, the history of witches and witch hunting is really fascinating. I'd love to learn more about it because I, I'm from Darlington, which is probably under an hour away from uh, Berwick or Berwick, as we would call it up north. And I now live about an hour drive from Pendle Hill, which uh, all the Pendle witch trials that went on there as well. So it's a big part of our British history. Um, but then I'll, I'll move on to the third and final aspect that I um, wondered about, which is trick or treat. Because this all seems completely like uh, detached from, from the other aspects and not very macabre either, or maybe it is macabre, I don't know. How did Trick or Treat come into play in Halloween? Okay, it's it's another one of those very misunderstood things. Um, again, I often see these things saying it goes back centuries. It does not. Um, <laughs> there were some similar things that people did on All Souls Day, which is celebrated on November 2nd, and kind of spilled over a little bit of them. All Souls Day they was about um, praying for the souls of your loved ones who might be trapped in purgatory. And so there was a tradition that sprang up called souling. And souling was this idea where uh, originally beggars would go from house to house and they would offer to say 
prayers for your loved ones in exchange for food. And the food became ritualized. It became these special little cakes that were baked just for that purpose. And then children started painting themselves up as beggars and going from house to house to get these little soul cakes. And although it's tempting to draw a direct line between that and trick-or-treat, the truth is there is not one. Um, trick-or-treat comes about in mainly the 1930s. And it was a response to the way Halloween was being celebrated up until then, which was by pike play. In America, um, the boys had taken on this Irish tra tradition of playing pranks and jokes on Halloween. And originally, it was all kind of innocent. If you look, for example, at postcards from 1915, 1920, they often show boys playing pranks. And the pranks were typically things like they would disassemble a gate and move it to the roof of the barn or something crazy like that. Um, this this was so common that it actually was called date night in a lot of places. And so the pranks were kind of innocent, but then America became more and more urbanized. The pranks moved into the cities, and then it became very destructive. Um, it became out-and-out -out vandalism. Cities were experiencing millions of dollars worth of damage because these pranksters were breaking light fixtures and smashing windows and setting fires and tripping pedestrians. And um, it this was during the height of the Great Depression, so it was hard to deal with these massive amounts of numbers that these boards were racking a lot of cities were thinking about banning Halloween, but a few came up with a better idea, which was to buy these pranksters off. And, and you can actually find little pamphlets from the mid-30s that were put out in some of the cities that were guides sent to homeowners saying, here's how you can do this on Halloween night and entertain these kids and keep them from playing pranks. And because it was the Depression, they would suggest that a number of houses get together to bear the weight of giving these kids a party. So the first house would give the kids a simple costume, like just a sheet to be a ghost or some leftover clothes from the attic. The next house would give them a little game. The next house might give them a little primitive version of a haunted attraction in the basement. And then a house would give them treats. And this caught on gigantically. Um, it was very successful. It worked in buying the kids off. And then it's not until 1939 that we get the first mention of the phrase trick or treat in, in a national American magazine. So from that point on is really kind of when we reckon the start of trick or treat, even though it had been around in other parts of the country for about 10 years at that point. Right. And these aspects that we're discussing, they're very sort of uh, British and American. And I know we America seems to celebrate it a lot bigger than we do over here in the UK. And as I as I mentioned, a lot of the folklore I have no idea about, and uh, I, the name of Halloween, it's it's one of those things that just it's the thing that happens before Christmas. The 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 festivity before Christmas and it's getting darker on the nights. Um, but are there, are there big differences about how other cultures celebrate Halloween? Are, are there different alternatives of there? I, d I don't even know if many other cultures do celebrate Halloween. Well, one of the interesting thing that, things that has happened with this, this holiday over the last just 15 years, this is really quite, quite recent, is how it has been exported from America around the world. Um, when I first wrote the, the encyclopedia, which was uh, circa 2000, 2001, um, there was very little to report globally. It was almost completely an American celebration. And by the time I got around to doing my book, Trip or Treat, A History of Halloween in 2012, just in that 10 or 11 year span, it had exploded around the world. Um, and there are some interesting reasons for that export, um, which are kind of surprising. Sitcoms, American syndicated sitcoms are beloved around the world. And every major sitcom had Halloween episodes, uh, especially The Simpsons, one of the most successful syndicated shows in history, which does a yearly treehouse of horror Halloween episode. Uh, the sitcom Roseanne was obsessed with Halloween. 
Halloween, and would show these these elaborate Halloween celebrations that the family in that show engaged in. And people loved the holiday when they saw it in their favorite shows all over the world. And then another thing that happens is marketing and retailing. So you get companies like McDonald's coming in with their Halloween Happy Meals and um, people again are now getting exposed to this holiday and and it's hard to turn it down. I mean, who doesn't love dressing their kid up in a cute costume and the beautiful orange colors and the, um, the, the candy and the whole thing? It just really has caught on throughout much of the Northern Hemisphere in particular. It's a little harder in the Southern Hemisphere because the seasons are reversed. So it doesn't have all of the sort of fall and autumn associations in, say, Australia that is now catching on gigantically in Australia as well. Right. I I, um, I just, as you were speaking, remembered when I was in Malaysia in this small, uh, I think it's a city in East Malaysia, so in Borneo, Kota Kinabalu, and I was there during Halloween. And even they in this small uh, small church we were at had a Halloween party, and it it was very different to the Halloween parties that uh, I had when I was um, in England. But still, everyone dressed up still, and we had games. Uh, and think I dressed up as Mister Bean. I thought that would be funny because I was British. Um, but yeah, it's so it is so interesting to think that it it's because of that sort of retailing of it and the the merchandising of it. I mean, does do you think religion still has a role to play in Halloween at all? Not much, and, and the church kind of saw to that. Um, they removed a lot of the sort of observances and special masses and so forth that went with it, I think, back in the 50s. Um, it used to have an octave, which is, you know, like an eight-day religious observance that was removed, I think, in something like 55. So it is still a celebration within the Catholic Church, but it's a sort of minor one now. Is that where the name comes from, Halloween, in terms of All Hallows' Eve? Is that sort of All Saints' Day sort of the same thing? Exactly. Yeah, and it's interesting that up until about 1940, the name even still had the apostrophe in it in the, between the two E's, indicating that the V had been dropped. So um, by about 1940 on, onwards, the apostrophe went away, and it just became the name we know now. Yeah, it's quite a strange name, really, as Halloween, when you look at the word. It is quite strange. And... Um... If today, this is this is a strange question that I'm going to ask. If today's Halloween, as we know it, that it, that is quite modern and uh, commercial, and you see people putting on uh, massive like haunted houses and things like that, if it wasn't commercialized and if it if it hadn't had that sort of overtaking of retail and things, what do you think Halloween would look like today? Well, there are some other aspects, I think, that would play into that as well. For example, Trick or Treat took a big hit in the 60s and 70s when people became obsessed with the idea that their children's candy was being tampered with. And that is an urban legend. There is very little history of that ever actually happening. But, but because of that, it started to move to a more adult holiday. Now, had that, for example, never happened, had there never been... Um, a Tylenol scare in the 70s that spilled over into other areas where Tylenol was poisoned in stores and people started to think that could happen to their kids at trick-or-treat, that kind of thing. Um, I Would trick-or-treat still be around? I think so. It is still around. It is just sort of reduced these days and it tends to be very compartmentalized now. It's It's either kids are taken to malls or to zoos or to even special neighborhoods. Um, I know here in the U.S. it's become very regionalized. I'm always interested in hearing from people in other parts of the country who will say, oh, yeah, it's now just in this, like, three-block area in my town, that kind of thing. Um, but if it had not been so commercialized, I don't know. That's It's entirely possible, I suppose, it would have become nothing but a very minor celebration, but in an increasingly fearful 
wonderful society. And I, I think many of us respond to Halloween because we like having that one day a year when we can kind of test our fears in a very safe manner. So had it not been for Halloween, we might have something equivalent, I think. Yeah, it is sort of that one event in the year that has that macabre dark nature. I can't think of anything else really that that does bring that spot. And there is a different feeling because of that. And I mean, to be honest, there are a lot of religions who seem to have an issue with it still, even to this day, sort of. I mean, in your book, it, it was said that um, some people see it as the devil's birthday, almost, or or like uh, demonic. I mean, is there anything is there anything to that, or do you think that they just need to sort of lighten up? Well, that is based on a historical misconception, um, and that was one of the more interesting things that I managed to unearth in in researching trick or treat that I had missed in my earlier books. I really was curious about where that came from, and I was able to trace it back to an 18th century British surveyor named Charles Valency. And Valency was sent by um, the British royalty over to Serpent. And while he was there, he became obsessed with Celtic history and lore. And he started writing his, his findings down and he amassed a gigantic amount of information. He published it in a six volume set. And the only problem with this was that Valency was a, just a complete charlatan. He, he was roundly de denounced by every major historian of the day. He decided just out of nowhere that the commonly accepted things that had been long established, like the meaning of Samhain being summer's end, were not true, that he he knew better. And he went out of his way to try and connect the, the, the word Samhain to an Indian deity named Saman. And he, from that, went on, and it, it's impossible to read it, this completely daft conclusion that, therefore, the Celts worshipped a lord of death named Saman or something on this date. And uh, everyone just, at the time, looked at that and said, well, that's ludicrous. But unfortunately, these six volumes of books found their way into libraries all over the world and created what I often think of as the strange alternate history of Halloween, which is that it is based on a celebration of a Celtic Lord of Death. And you can see that being perpetuated even in Halloween books of the 20th century. And I am fairly convinced that that's what led eventually to this notion that it is the devil's birthday and it's satanic in, in origin and so forth. I suppose as well there is this link now with even when you're not doing sort of horror stuff and it's more about the pumpkins and the it's got an autumnal feel about it and you're you're sort of having the darker nights there is also this link of we seem to associate it with horror films and the horror genre and you know much to my dislike I'll say um me and my wife on Halloween will watch a horror film in the evening. And I just, I can't stomach horror films, but she makes the watches. And obviously a lot of horror films have that sort of demonic, satanic um, edge to them. A, a lot of the, uh, and they're really far out uh, many of the satanic ones, but still there is that link. Um, and you have written a absolute ton of horror short stories. Uh, I was looking through the list uh, while I was preparing, and I was like, "Oh my goodness, how how do you come up with the ideas for these stories?" Um, yeah, I I've written an awful lot of fiction, much of it Halloween themed. Um, I've always just been a storyteller. I think when I was a kid, I was an only child, and we moved a lot, and so well, I would make up stories. I think to entertain myself and. Um, for me, ideas are not the hard part. Finding the time to actually sit down and write them is. So, yeah, the, the ideas for me are everywhere. I can look out my, my window in my office right now and get five ideas in a few minutes. So, uh -huh. And I have been very fortunate to reach a point in my fiction career where I'm somewhat in demand. And so a lot of the stories that I write are to a particular theme. Oh, I'm editing an anthology based on 
Shakespeare, can you give me a story for that? Um, so quite often the idea is somewhat dictated by but what you're being hired to, to present. Right. That, that's so fun, though, to be able to... I really admire that because uh, the idea stuff is just... It blows my mind. And when you read some horror fiction, you, you're thinking there... And some of them, when they're really out there, um, you read them and you're like, how did they think of this? How did they come up with this as you as you're being freaked out that is uh, have you ever written a story that is just you've been writing it and it's just been so spooky like that it's freaked you out a bit there was one that that freaked me out a bit and it was a following themed novella called summer's end and i wanted to do something very challenging with that which was um to make myself the main character and I knew that was going to be difficult when I started it. Um, for me, there was there had to be a sort of dividing line between the author and this main character, and it was it was a difficult write. Uh, right, but uh, um, it did that one. Yeah, that one bothered me to write for I think obvious reasons. Yeah, and what would you say was the the spookiest story that you've written? Um, I I kind of want to leave that to readers to discover. Oh. Um, I have written so many; it would be hard for me to to pick one. I am probably at about two hundred short stories right now, and four novels, and probably what half a dozen novellas. So there's so much. I'm not sure I would have one that I pick as a favorite. I have probably four or five that would fall into my overall favorites category. Right. Do you have a favorite horror film? I do, which is The Exorcist. Um, I saw The Exorcist when I was 15, and it was still in its original release, and it was a humongous hit. And um, seeing that film in a theater in 1974, when you were very young, was an absolute mind-blowing experience and for me it was not even so much about the film but about how pe people reacted to it um you it's hard now to explain to people who were not there because there has not been a film like that since but people people were absolutely terrified by that film they screamed they ran out of the theater people were passing out i mean it was insane I remember just sitting in that theater in 1974 and actually even at some point turning around looking behind me just to watch people and thinking, this is what I want to do. Uh, um, I want to have this kind of impact on people. So that was the film that kind of changed the destination of my life. Right. That's so interesting. I, I didn't know that it had that reaction. Was that like the first sort of big horror film it was, um, I mean, there had been Rosemary's Baby before that, um, but yeah, nothing nothing before had had that kind of impact on people, unless you, I mean, I've heard that the original Frankenstein in the 30s impacted people that way, but I certainly haven't seen it since. Um, I don't know if it's even still possible to affect people that deeply, and, and it was interesting at the time, um, new uh, magazine covers were would have stories called the exorcist frenzy and you would go into i remember a couple of weeks after the movie had been released we were um out at a restaurant and our waitress looked very ill and we were concerned for it we said hey are you okay and she said oh i'm okay i just haven't slept in two weeks since i saw that movie i it was just uh, the impact of this thing across the entire society was just insane right and do you, what do you think about the current state of horror films? Because they seem to really just push them out now, and they, I, I don't know. What do you think about them? I, to me, there are still some great ones being made. Um, one of the interesting changes over the last couple of decades has been how much of it has moved to television. Um, I almost think the best horror is now being done on television. Uh, there is a French series that's streamed on Netflix called Marianne, which is one of the absolute best things I've ever seen in horror. Um, it, 
It is incredible. I think it's eight episodes. I've watched it three times. Many of my horror writing friends have watched it over and over, and, and very few people know about it. So if you have Netflix, I highly recommend Marianne. Be prepared to be really scared. It's very frightening and really good. Um, but yeah, there sometimes I have older friends who will say, oh, there's no good horror being made. And, and to me, I think one of the things that our memories tend to do is we forget the crap we saw 30 or 40 years years ago and just remember the really good ones i mean there's always been a lot of bad films being made and we don't think about those after a while and and there are still things being made now that i think we will still be talking about in another 30 years right i've written that down marianne on netflix and And watch it uh, subtitled watch it it (laughs) subtitled yeah oh i can't stand up and is there a from your perspective as a horror writer and obviously an enthusiast on Halloween and with your horror writer friends, how do I, I really struggle with, with horror and spooky things. And I'm going to sound like a wimp on this podcast, but I, I have to look away. I, and I can't sleep at night when I watch something. Is there a, is there a secret to not being too scared to the point where you can just sit down and enjoy them? Um, I I don't know that there's a secret to it. I I think it's just kind of how you're hardwired. Um, there's an interesting book that that you might enjoy that just came out about two years ago, ago called A Very Nervous Person's Guide to Horror. Um, it's by a wonderful um scholar named Matthias Clayson, and and he has been doing some remarkable work in the actual hard physiological study of horror. Um, he's really interesting. He has charted how our brains respond to these things and how certain um, upbringings or certain characteristics tie into the physiological responses. And that actually might help you at least understand why horror affects you differently than it affects other people. Um, he's he's always worth checking out. Clayson, C-L-A-S-E-N, last name. I've written that down as well. I, I've got some good takeaways from today. And thinking of sort of uh, to wrap this special Halloween episode up, uh, I was thinking if you could give us any tips for throwing a, a really authentic um, Halloween celebration. Oh, a really authentic. If I was, I always had this fantasy of throwing a traditional 18th century Halloween party, and I have not done it yet, but um, if I were going to, I would have lots of fun little fortune-telling games around. This is how they celebrated Halloween in the 18th century. We know this privately from the poet Robert Burns wrote a very long poem called Halloween, which is a description of a Scottish Halloween party. And when you read the poem, it sounds so fun. Um, it's this gathering of people who would play these games like setting nuts in front of a fireplace and you name the nuts for different people that you would like to be involved with. And depending on which nut cracks first might be the person you're going to end up marrying or um, playing games involving bobbing for apples or jumping over these uh, candles blindfolded. I mean, there were all kinds of fun games that were played. And they told ghost stories, and they they drank, and they ate very particular special foods for that time of year, and um, it sounds really fun. So if I was going to do a traditional Halloween party, I would probably go out and read the Robert Burns poem and try to follow the model. That's brilliant. I, I'm going to accept the challenge, and after hearing this, I'm going to throw a traditional Halloween party. I'm, you know, we... I've had a lot of trunk and treats uh, over here. Every year, it's we decorate the boot of the. It should be boot and treat for the UK. We never call them trunks, but we still call them trunk or treat. We decorate the boot of the car, and we go around and pick them. We we have a fancy dress costume, a pumpkin costume. I'm throwing that all out the window this year. I'm gonna do a Robert Burns traditional Halloween, and we may I may even create some cheese to go around and 
and fly around. If I, I'm going to dress up as a she, actually. That's what I'm going to do. That might be really scary. Oh, that's yeah. Dress up. yeah. Well, Wait, send me photos if you do. <laughs> I definitely will. I'll send you some photos of my uh, traditional Halloween celebration. And I uh, hope you have a great Halloween this year, Lisa. Do you have any big plans for Halloween this year? Well, of course, my October is always insane, which is one of the reasons I'm grateful to you for inviting me to chat in August. Um, but we uh, we bought our house here in the, the uh, foothills about eight years ago. And as soon as we had a house, um, we decided we wanted to do our own little tiny sort of yard haunt. So we do what is really just an elaborate it um makeover of our front yard we we dress our driveway as a cemetery and we have projections going in the windows of ghosts and things and um last year we managed to score one of the much desired 12 foot skeletons from home depot so we will set that up thing um it's really fun even though i'm in a a cul-de-sac and a little bit hidden away we get families who come year after year and we'll look at things and say oh i like that you added that or that's really fun that's new and they get their kids to pose with the figures and in the graveyard and it's really fun that does sound great i'm gonna revitalize that spirit of halloween decorating over here we you just don't see it anywhere and uh, we need to bring it back. And I thank you, Lisa, for your time today. I've really enjoyed speaking to you. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate your time. And thank you for having me on. This was fun. And I hope you have a great day and I'll see you later. Thanks for watching For All The Saints. This show needs your help to grow. Please like the video, comment your thoughts subscribe to the channel and share this with someone you think would enjoy it. Thank you.